Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, I take about eight used firearms that have come into the store, either through the front door or through our website, and we do about a two to four minute review on each one to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell anything to keep it in accordance with YouTube's policies. With all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, this video is brought to you by our website, webuyguns.com. If you are considering selling a firearm or firearms collection, please log on to our website and create an account. From there, you can submit your firearms for an offer request. With that offer, you will get a printable offer certificate, which you can take with you to competing gun stores in your area to try and leverage yourself a better deal. If you're unable to get a better deal, go ahead and sell it to us. We do provide you with a prepaid shipping label. Also, we will pay you with either a paper check or ACH Bank Direct deposit to make the process as seamless and easy for you as possible. Remember, go check us out at webuyguns.com. Getting into this video, remember we start with the most common and move through least common as the video progresses. Starting off with our first firearm, which if you saw my most recent surplus under $300 uh, series that we just put out, uh, this was actually in there. This is a Star Model A Super that comes to us from a local customer. Now these are actually really, really cool surplus firearms that are not very expensive and are actually a lot of fun out on the range. Now the history with this would begin back in the early 1920s, around 1922, when Spain was looking to modernize their military armaments. We saw a lot of that happening around the world through the 1920s and the interwar period between World War I and World War II, and Spain was no exception with this. Now, like a lot of other countries, they had been noticing the success of the new Browning design, the 1911 45 ACP pistol, and wanted to come out with somewhat, I guess you could say, a clone. Based on looking at it, there were some functional differences between the two, but it was very much uh, inspired by the 1911 design and first chambered in the Spanish 9mm Largo, which is just like a standard 9mm that's a little bit longer. People call them 9mm long, Largo in Spanish long. Um, through the 1920s, they would be produced, and then going into the Second World War, they would come out with the Star Model B, which was a 9mm, 9mm Parabellum 9mm Luger. Now, the interesting thing about that is it did go into German military service, as Spain and Germany were allied during the Second World War, so you can find Star Model Bs in 9mm Parabellum 9mm Luger with the German Waffen amps and, and those sorts of things, as well as the Astra pistols, like the Astra 300 was very popularly used by the Luftwaffe due to its small nature. Um, now, after the Second World War through about 1946 through the 1980s, Spain would modernize the design of the B model, calling it the Super by adding some updated revisions and use it within the Spanish military. The A Super models, which is this, 9mm Largo, would also be produced as well. Star also made a P series, which was chambered in 45 ACP, which was for the export, uh, consumer export, most notably here in the United States. Um, when they went to the super designation, they changed a couple things. The first thing they did is they added a quick uh, takedown lever here on this side of the pistol. The original Star Model A and Model B did have a swing link system on the barrel, just like the 1911. They did change it into a cam link system like you find on a Browning High Power. They moved it from a separate recoil spring and guide to a fixed recoil spring and guide. Uh, they added a magazine disconnect and they improved upon the trigger. I believe that pretty much sums up the changes that were made. Uh, throughout the 1980s, of course, these would slowly be discontinued for military service and they would end up here on the surplus market and have really since the 1980s been a really affordable option. Now, recently there has been the Model BM, the compact version of the Model B, the 9mm, that has come into the market within about the past five years, and those are very inexpensive. You could typically find them under $200. The more full-size Model As and Model Bs tend to be anywhere from about $200 to $400, depending on condition, and they are pretty easy to find. Uh, the 9mm, I'm sorry, the Model Bs tend to go for a little bit more due to the ammo availability of the 9mm Luger. The 9mm Largo is a little bit tough to find. There were not that many firearms chambered in 9 Largo, uh, but it is relatively out there on the market if you look hard enough at gun shows and gun shops and online. 
uh, but they are still a blast to shoot. If you like 1911s, you would feel right at home on them. It's a really, really cool uh, pistol design from the 1920s through the 1940s in Spain. If you're into military history and collecting, it's definitely a cool one to have, especially if you can find a Model B with German markings on it. Those tend to go a little bit higher. I've seen them in the $500 to $800 range, respectively, based on condition. Of course, anything, once you put those German markings on them, they go up in value. But very, very cool pistols nonetheless, uh, nonetheless and uh, happy to get this one in and share it with you guys. So that is a Star Model A Super. Okay, up next I have a couple really nice 1911s that come to us from a local customer. So thank you so much for selling these to us. These are Para Ordnance, technically Para USA 1911s. This is a GI Expert, this is an LTC, this is a full-size government, this is a commander, and both of them are in 45 ACP. A Para Ordnance would be founded by two childhood friends in 1985 in Canada. One of the great things about Para Ordnance was their forward thinking nature as a company and thinking outside the box when it came to the very popular 1911 design. They would come out with a double stack version of the 1911. They would come out with a double action variation on the trigger. These are traditionally known as being single action pistols. And it would get a lot of attention in you know, shooting circles, shooting enthusiasts through the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Now, like a lot of foreign companies, they would make a strategic move to move their operations to the United States in 2009 when they would be renamed as Para USA under the same ownership. And they would produce uh, their products for an additional three years in North Carolina until they would be acquired by Remington Freedom Group, uh, which then would quickly dissolve the brand as they would focus all the attention of the new manufacturing techniques, equipment, tooling and material to their already existing R series or R1 series of 1911s already produced by Remington. So that's when the UTS would cease to exist. I would be reluctant to call these collectibles, even though they are no longer made, but maybe give another 10 or 15 years, people will look at these as collectibles as people sell them off and then, you know, want to relive their introduction to 1911 shooting, which a lot of people got into with Para USA and Para Ordnance 1911s due to their price point. You got a really nice quality, very functional 1911, great ergonomics, weight, balance, build, very tight, very nice trigger, nice reset. Um, for not a whole lot of money. Even today on the used market, these are not very high. They are both, I would say both of these are sub thousand dollars, probably between six and eight hundred dollars respectively. During this trigger, just really, really tight. These are probably both very gently used. Um, so for the money, you can get into a very nice solid 1911. Uh, this one has a bunch of upgrades added to it and whatnot. So anyway, really, really cool firearms. Happy to get these in and share them with you. Uh, and again, if you do find one at a local gun show or a gun store, it's the double stack versions that tend to get a little bit more attention and are definitely worth picking up and taking a look at. Uh, maybe if you want to get into the 1911 uh, family through a nice build at not a high price with something that may appreciate in value over time due to their unavailability right now on the market, a Para USA or Para Ordnance 1911 may be the way to go. So really happy to get these in and share them with you. All right, up next, I have a really nice pistol that comes to us from a viewer in Arizona. This is a Beretta M9A1 compact Inox 9mm pistol. Now, of course, here in the United States, the Beretta M9 series definitely has a big following due to its military service introduction in the early 1980s. But the history would really begin back uh, just after post-World War II in the early 1950s when Italy would think about moving from its then-used 1934 small caliber, 1934 and 1935 Beretta small caliber pistols into something a little bit more substantial and full size. Uh, like they had seen used in the war, most notably with things like the uh, Walther P38. Now they would get to work with the design which would come out in 1951 known as the Beretta 1951, which would have a lot of success in other countries like Egypt uh, with the um, uh, Hell One pistol and then you have uh, Iraq, the Tariq variation thereof, uh, first introduced in an alloy frame which would be used to some limited extent in the future but also was quickly adapted for a steel frame designation or steel frame construction uh, with a single stack magazine and 9mm. Now over the, through the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, Beretta would do a bunch of different design uh, iterations. They would update it, moving it into a single stack. They would have the Beretta S, the F, and then the FS. And then the United States would put out a solicitation for a new service sidearm to replace the then use uh, 1911 uh, service pistol. Of course, the John Moses Browning design chambered in 45 ACP. Now NATO had done testing after the Second World War and determined that 
typically in a skirmish or a firefight scenario, the side that was able to produce the higher volume of fire was more likely to win. So this higher powered, less capacity concept in handguns and long guns had been sort of been, we've been moving away through that in the 60s and the 70s to things of smaller caliber with a higher capacity. Obviously seeing things like the M16s, AKs taking the forefront in uh, service use around the world, so too would go the higher capacity 9mm pistols. Now, in the early 1980s, the M9 trials would begin, of which Beretta would introduce their pistol that they had, and long story short, it would win in 1982 and go into full-scale production through about the mid to late uh, 80s, the 85 to about 1990, it would be fully have, have transitioned into the M9 service pistol. Now, because of that, the Beretta series of pistols have made a huge splash on the American consumer market, and Beretta has revamp the design into many different packages, one very popular one you see here. Now in about 2009, they would come out with the A1 series, I believe it was about 2009, maybe, maybe it had been a little bit before that, 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. They would come out with the A1 variation. Uh, most notably, they would add a rail to it. And then a couple years ago, because of the XM17 handgun trials, they would come out with the A3, which was, you know, it had a more shallow grip angle. It was in the FDE or Coyote tan finish with um, a uh, rail like you see here on the A1. But this is sort of a middle between the A3 where we are now and the traditional M9 as it was issued back in the mid 80s. Also on top of that, this is the very popular Beretta Inox version, which is their name for the stainless. So making this the compact stainless A1, which makes this a pretty interesting firearm. Very, very nice, smooth. I mean, all of the functionality of all of them is very, very similar, but just has always been a huge seller in the U.S. consumer market in any variety. So this is just really nice, comfortable, uh, ergonomic, concealable to most people, just a really cool firearm. Now, the Inox M9A1s typically have a new retail price, if you look at their website, MSRP, around the $800 mark. However, lately due to, I believe, the scarcity of these, the pricing on these has been a little bit high, so I've seen really good condition used ones like these, pushing up around the thousand dollar mark or beyond so again a lot of people definitely covet these inox beretta so really really cool pistols overall and if you've never had the chance to shoot a beretta m9 92 fs of any variety definitely worth taking a look at just uh, a huge amount of uh, following on these very popular and great shooting pistols so happy to get this one in Okay, up next, I have a beautiful rifle that comes to us again from a local customer. And really what this is, is a Mauser Action rifle that has been built or sporterized somewhere along its life. Now, anytime I get these in, I like to showcase them on this video as they all, all are different and unique as they've all seen different series of modifications and different techniques in building to different configurations, calibers, stock types, scope options, and things like that. So each one is unique in their own right. Now, inherently, I am usually against the sporterization of military, actually always against the sporterization of military arms, but it was common practice through the 50s, mainly through the 50s through the 80s, as these are very uh, inexpensive and not really regarded as collectible, uh, collectibles, excuse me, by most people. Uh, what you have here is, of course, the Mauser Action has been one of the most prolific, most popular, most successful, and most copied actions for any bolt action style of rifle since its inception by Peter Paul and Wilhelm Mauser in the late 1890s. Of course, most notably, this would go on to serve the German military in the First and Second World War, as well as militaries around the country, including, I guess you could say, the United States, because the 1903 Springfield was also a very close derivative of the Mauser action itself. Now, what you would typically get is post-World War II, you have a lot of vets returning home and you would find surplus firearms by the truckload at next to nothing in terms of cost. Generally speaking, most of the vets who had served overseas as well as a lot of the civilian population back here in the United States was pretty sick and tired of the war and anything that had to do with it, including surplus firearms. So it was common to go into your local supplier, your gun dealer, your hardware store and find infields, Mausers, uh, Arasakas, um, Tarkanos, you know, tucked inside of barrels with a tag on it that usually said like a dollar to three dollars or five dollars for, you know, take your pick and then take it home. Also because of the caliber uh, availability being typically known as foreign ammunition, 303, 8 millimeter, 77. Uh, a lot of these would be, you know, there would be a big impulse to recaliber, rechamber them to something that was a little bit more easily found at home, like the common variety of sporting loads or 30-06 and some, you know, things along those lines. 
So typically you would get things like this, and because the Mauser was always viewed as being a very strong and robust action, the K98 Mausers, or any Mauser variety, was always fodder for sporterization. Again, between the 50s through the 80s, and this would be an example of that. So I do know for a fact that the gentleman who sold this to us, it was it was his grandfather who had sporterized it. So we can assume, you know, probably around, I don't know, the 50s or so that this was done. But they would typically take what was otherwise a very inexpensive and cheap and undesirable rifle. This one was reboard to 280 Remington or 7 6 um, You know, very rich blue put on it, a nice free-floated stock, uh, polished up the, the bolt. And really turned it into a very attractive sporting rifle in a caliber that could, well, it's actually funny, you could probably find 8mm now more available today than you can 280 Remington uh, to some extent. But uh, really, really well done. Some of these are sporterized better than others, and that's really kind of the nature of it, uh, which again turns it into even a viable deal, deer rifle today. Now, because the sporterized nature of the firearm, it typically does not enhance on its value unless it was something done by a well-known uh, gunsmith or firm, because it was also common for gunsmiths or firms to take, again, pre-existing military Mausers and reconfigure them into modern sporting rifles. Some of those can demand actually quite a bit of money, but something that was done at home by your typical gunsmith or typical, you know, uh, you know, behind the storage shed, you know, type of or bubba is what a lot of collectors call them they do not retain a whole lot of value. Something like this may go in about the three to $600 range respectively based on the buyer. This one was actually done very well, but it will never ever achieve the same amount of value that a true unmolested K98 Mauser would ever bring on the open market. So still a really cool token of the past and unfortunate again that it was sporterized, but you do still have to appreciate the artisanship of reconverting or converting or repurposing a rifle into something that somebody probably used for 20 or 30 years as a deer rifle. So it's just a cool piece of history and anytime I get one of these in, I like to showcase it again as each one is unique and different. So really cool, a sporterized Mauser rifle. Okay, up next we have a firearm that comes to us from a viewer in Georgia. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is an HK416 pistol. It is chambered in 22, unfortunately. Uh, but a really, really cool firearm nonetheless. Now, this of course was a development of HK, but came about due, the to, due to the solicitation by the United States Delta Force by the behest of Larry Vickers, who I'm sure many of you know to come up with a new ideal CQB close quarters rifle, uh, submachine gun, if you will, something very small, compact, ergonomic, for close in engagements. Okay, at the time in the arsenal, you either have the choice of an MP5 or an M4 carbine. There's quite a gap between the two. The MP5 has a really nice, compact, lightweight, rugged, very easy, very maneuverable to handle, very easy to use and, and close in engagements. However, as in a pistol caliber, you have the M4, which is in the, the more ideal 5.56 but is a little bit larger. It is a little bit more unwieldy than something like an MP5. So the con the concept or the goal was to get something that was somewhat of a hybrid of the two, making it the ultimate PDW firearm. Now, HK would answer the call, and again, this is through the 1990s, by offering up a development of what would later be known as the 416, which was essentially this package. You had a very, very small compact design, of course, with a stock on it, which was chambered in the 5.56 and was also a short, short stroke, excuse me, gas piston getting away from the direct impingement that was typically used in the M4. Very, very long, uh, long longevity of the parts and service use. Um, very, very light on malfunctions. Uh, very, very good, durable design, of course, put out by HK. Now, HK did make a civilian version of this, and if you find one of those, they're very hard to come by. They will run you in anywhere from about four to five thousand dollars. So, very expensive. But they also came out, and this is under license, made by Walther and imported into the United States, a somewhat of a facsimile of the very popular 416. So if you want a 416 at a much lower price point, something that's more affordable that you could go out and have fun with, while also you know tr uh, training new shooters and stuff like that, these are really, really cool options. They are a very close representation using actually aluminum components, the build, the, the fit, the finish, and the, uh, the, the manipulation of the controls and everything is very similar and indicative to what you're gonna find on the standard 416 model. Again, it's just a 22, not a 5.56. 
So really, really cool. On the market today, and I don't believe that they're currently making these, they're pushing upwards between about five and $600 used right now. That's typically where you would find them new, but of course, when it becomes harder to find things, the pricing will go up. But again, something really, really cool to get into. I've had a few of these here in my store before. In fact, I've had them on previous videos, but anytime I get one of these in, I don't like to uh, waste an opportunity to put a cool HK or HK licensed Walther out on the videos for you. So there it is, an HK 41622. All right, up next is a really interesting little firearm that I've actually not had one of in here before, but this is a Rossi Model 62 SA, and the SA stands for Slide Action. Now, if you're looking at this, you're probably thinking, well, that looks a lot like a Winchester gallery gun, and it really does, and it's more or less a copy of that. Now, this being of the round barrel variety, to me, looks more like the Winchester Model 1906, but they did make this in an octagonal barrel as well, which would be more indicative of the 1890 model. Um, and these would be manufactured by Rossi in Brazil and imported into the United States by Inner Arms, going into production in the early 1970s and ending production in the late 1990s. Now, as many people know, today Rossi is owned by Taurus, and Taurus puts out a similar product today, a more modernized uh, variant as well, but they do have pump action 22s if you're interested in that sort of thing and want to find something a little bit more available as the Rossi and the Winchester versions are a little bit difficult to find. But undoubtedly, I've had several, maybe 10 Winchester gallery guns from different model variants. I've never had one of these, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, the Winchester gallery gun concept would come about again in the, in the year 1890 and was a really innovative, innovative concept and was a very popular uh, seller on the consumer market for things like gallery events at carnivals, fairs, festivals, as well as purchasing for kids to go out and shoot tin cans, rabbits, or anything else. Of course, the collectability of those has stayed pretty strong ever since their introduction in the late 1800s. A couple different model variations were introduced with mod, uh, sort of mild modifications to them. And of course, a lot of people on the market even today collect them. That would create a reason for companies, again, through their most recent history, like Rossi and Taurus, to come out with a new revamped and modern produced version to be more accessible to people in the consumer market as there's a demand for it. You see this happen with single action armies in 1911s and things like that as well. Now this, of course, has turned into somewhat of a rarity as well, since they are no longer produced and have not been produced for over 20 years. So really, really cool, just a pump action 22 rifle and you know feels very strong robust and sturdy uh, on the market today these are not super expensive they are climbing though i see them anywhere from about four to five hundred dollars in really good condition which funny enough you could pick up an original winchester for that although it won't be in excellent condition if you had a winchester 1906 in this condition it might press up over a thousand dollars but anyway really really cool rifle and unique just wanted to share it on this video real quick with you and that is a rossi 62 sa Okay, up next I have a really cool rifle that comes to us from a local customer. This is a PTR Industries PTR 32 762 by 39 rifle, which does take AK magazines. Now, if you look at the general looks or appearance of this rifle without the mag inserted, you would say it's a HK91 or G3 or a PTR91. It is essentially the same rifle, just chambered in 762 by 39, which is an interesting concept. There was actually experimental versions of the G3 that were chambered in 7.62 by 39, but I digress. If we look at the history of this, we really look at the tail end of World War II. Most countries are issuing a standard issue bolt action rifle chambered in a full size rifle cartridge. There had been some countries that had been experimenting with semi-automatic development, mainly the United States with the M1 Garand, uh, Russia with the SVT-40, and Germany with the G43 rifles, and other countries had noted the success of those designs, being able to produce a higher volume of fire on the battlefield. Through the 1950s, a lot of other countries would decide that they wanted to revamp their militaries, going into a semi-automatic battle rifle concept, full rifle cartridge, magazine fed, of which Spain was one that had interest in doing that. They commissioned the help of German engineer Ludwig von Grimmler, who came up with a design that would ultimately culminate into the Semi Model C, which looked very much like this. Now, the rifle had a ton of success. Germany would notice the success, and they would adopt it themselves as the G3 rifle for the Bundeswehr German military at the time, with a couple changes, the most notable one being this drum uh, pivoting diopter sight on the rear. Uh, but it used the very robust rower a locking system similar to what was seen on the MG42, which again was German technology during the Second World War. Now HK, the manufacturer of the G3, would come up with a commercial export version known as the HK91 and 308. They also had the HK93 and 556 and bring them into the country during the 1980s, bring them into the United States that is. 
1989, uh, then-President George Bush Sr. would implement the Sporting Clause, the importation ban on non-sporting rifles, of which the HK-91 and 93 were named specifically so they could no longer come into the country. Five years after that, in 94, then-President Clinton had put the assault weapons ban into place where you couldn't have scary military features on domestically uh, or imported, uh, fire, domestically manufactured or imported firearms. A company named JLD would then uh, come up with a bright idea, noticing that there was demand for this type of product, really, really cool, unique, interesting rifle. They would get tooling and uh, manufacturing plans from a, a company in Portugal who had been given the rights to manufacture HK91 variants. Um, and we talked about that when we looked at the Lusa carbine maybe three weeks ago. They then got the rights to that tooling and those plans brought them into the United States and the early, or I'm sorry, about the mid to late 1990s during the assault weapons ban and produced a clone of the HK91 or G3 with ban compliant parts. In 2004, a brand new emerging company called PTR Industries would purchase the company and the tooling and the, and the equipment and the rights to purchase the, the manufacture of this rifle from JLD, a uh, JDL, I'm sorry. Uh, get the two confused, JLD, I believe is what it is, but they would get the rights to produce this and then they would move forward with it now in entering business 2005-ish as PTR Industries with a good copy facsimile of the PTR-91. They have since come out with many different variations of the rifle off of this design, trying to modernize it a lot, one of which is this variant in 762 by 39 This would come out several years ago, I think it was like four or five, six years ago in 762 by 39 met with a mild success on the market and was discontinued from production, although I understand they are now back in production. Uh, and are available but out of stock in most places like Atlantic I think has them but they're out of stock. Uh, on the used market I'm seeing these guys hover around the thousand to twelve hundred dollar mark. New when they're available uh, they do have a retail price of about twelve. So really really cool firearms. Um, just I would actually love to take one out in 762 by 39 due to, the, due to the heft and weight. I understand they are actually a really joy to shoot but again they are very heavy. Not something I would probably get as a hunting rifle or anything like that. And I would still personally, you know, if I had to choose between the two going for this size, I would still stick with the 7.62x51 or 308. Uh, but still the concept of 7.62x39, if you have a bunch of the ammo and magazines, is a really, really cool idea. Something worth taking a look at. So anyway, happy to get that in and share it with you guys. Okay, last but not least is a really cool firearm that comes to us from a local customer. This is a Remington Sportsman Model 58. This one here is a 20 gauge. If we look at the end of the 1940s, just post-World War II, a lot of the domestic arms manufacturers had learned so much about armament production, assembly line manufacturing, part standardization that was essential to wide-scale, large-scale production during the Second World War. Now, out of that, you got a lot of interesting consumer firearms that came out at a more affordable price point that had a little bit more rigidity, a little bit more ruggedness than had typically been experienced in the 20s and 30s. You got a lot of really, really cool sporting firearms. The sporting market throughout the 50s and 60s was also really growing in the United States as well. So you got a lot of really cool innovation coming out of companies like Remington. In the late 1940s, they would develop a shotgun known as the 1148, which was a recoil-operated shotgun, which was met with huge success. It was a product that a lot of people hadn't seen. Of course, there were precursors to that, like the Model 11 from Remington, which is directly related to the Auto 5 from Browning. But to have something that was more affordable, very reliable, very rugged, very, very sleek and easy to use, the 1148 was definitely a home run on the consumer market. And trying to push upon the success of the 1148, Remington wanted to modernize the idea by changing up the gas system, making it a gas-operated rather than recoil-operated shotgun, bringing it into the more modern age. So in 1956, they would offer this, the Model 58 Sportsman. Now, the problem was is it did have a lot of issues that consumers were not too wild about. First and foremost, you're building more complexity up here at the front end. You're going to increase the cost of the shotgun. Other than the gas system, the 1148 was more or less the same firearm, but at a cheaper price. Also, because you're adding more parts up here at the front end, you're making it heavier. Because you're adding more parts, you're making it more complex, more prone to breakages, stoppages, uh, things like that as well. This would have been offered in three calibers. It would have been offered in 12, 20, and 16 gauge, as well as a version in a two and a three inch and a version in a three inch chamber. So having the gas system could help you potentially regulate between different uh, 
gas setting options to make the shotgun more reliable, but again, it would be more complicated to use. And because the gas system is at the front of the magazine tube, you're limiting yourself on capacity or magazine tube extension options, you know, further on down the road, which were none of these were problems on the cheaper, less expensive and more reliable 1148. A few years later, they would try to come out with a new design of the 58, I believe it was called the 878. If I don't have that mistake, I'll put it down below. I can't recall what the model number was, but it was a revamped version that self-regulated its own gas system. Again, did not solve a whole lot of the issues. Uh, it solved one of the issues with reliability, but the other issues were still there. The 1148 still outsold it. So in 1963, it would be discontinued. Now Remington learned a lot from the 58 and they learned a lot from the 1148. They decided to uh, combine the best features of both and out of that would come the 1100. Again, arguably probably one of the most owned semi-automatic shotguns today and has been a huge success in the consumer market since its inception. So we could thank this and the 1148 for the Model 1100. Because these were only produced for about six or seven years, they are not very easy to find on the market, especially in really good condition. Uh, so they do command a little bit of a collectible premium on them for what they are. Uh, something like this in this type of condition might go between uh, roughly six to $800 respectively. Um, of course, your different caliber options and barrel lengths and stuff are gonna vary. Uh, but this one is just an excellent example of that. And for any Remington or sh uh, some automatic shotgun collector in general, uh, this is definitely gonna be something that would fill a gap in a collection. So really, really cool to get in and happy to share with you the Remington 58 Sportsman. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting the like button and please remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. I'm going to leave you guys off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.